The focus was for fixed costs, what we've been spending oh, to okay. maintain the factory. Heating, electricity, all kinds of services, headcount, people, of course, salaries, uh, communications, IT, everything. Just slashed it back as much as you possibly could. The, the core of my conflict with shareholders, my position was that, listen, uh, we have we have this market, so we can only sell that many motorcycles. So instead of uh, like dreaming, well, let's just cut our costs, maybe raise our prices, but let's balance our cash flow so we can support ourselves, pay our bills at this amount of bike we can sell. My partners were pushing into different direction. They were saying that uh, we need to go to other market and they were thinking about going to the developing market, third countries, government contracts. And I was trying to explain to them that this is lottery. We have no control over uh, government uh, purchasing. How can we plan right. that we will get 500 bikes from here or 1,000 bikes from here? The only thing we can plan is the markets. We, we can make a difference ourselves is sell to retail public. This is where everything depends on us, right? Right. So let's focus on this. Even if it's 800 bikes, 1,000 bikes, 1,100 bikes, let's try to do something so we can be profitable and self-sufficient at this level of sales. And I couldn't find agreement. So as a result, we did exactly this at the end. Here's our sales, here's our expenses. We need to put expenses down to this level so we can at least meet our ends. You told me <coughs> about uh, a Russian bank. You're talking about Dmitry. Um, and there was a, a loan due. Mm. So then 2008 started, and the first half of the year it was okay. It was, I would say, even good. We could not keep up. Uh, we could not build enough bikes to uh, meet the demand. And then starting August or September, everything started like falling apart. And I remember I had a deal meeting in Europe uh, early in November of 2008. We were talking about our plans for 2009. So in less than a month, I had to go back to Europe. I met Harry in Vienna in the airport and I told him, Harry, all my plans going down the toilet. Toilet. <laughs> and we are going to shut down the factory for at least two months. I, seriously, maybe a month from the deal meeting. And then I flew to, to the factory and I uh, started talking to my manager there that we're not going to work in at least January, February because I don't see any sales coming. Uh, so what are we going to do about it? So we started uh, yet another round of restructuring. We started moving all the shops to one building and do some other stuff at the factory. So first, keep people busy, and second, cut the costs. So this is what we've been doing for the first two or three months of 2009. We weren't building bikes. They were just relocating. They were relocating, yeah, it, fixing the equipment and stuff like this. In 2009, in January, in the United States, we sold retail two motorcycles. <laughs> Later on, we were joking about it and laughing because we sold two units more than the Rolls Royce. <laughs> yeah, I think I read this before. It's a true story. Rolls Royce have not sold a single car in January of 2009 and we sold to motorcycle. We were very proud of it. But the reality was just terrible. <laughs> there were no sales, no money, no nothing. Um, we didn't have uh, like a line of credits we could use. We didn't have shareholders who could uh, pump us with money. We had nothing. It was just 
death. <laughs> I mean, it was very real. Uh, and this is when this episode happened. Uh, so we had the loan due, like in February or March. And uh, we had no money to pay it off. So I called the banker and tried to talk him into postponing it. He said no. So I called to factory manager and told him, that's it. <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna bankrupt us. This freaking bank. And then I called to one of the shareholders, told him the situation. He, he said, I'm, I'll think about it. And then I called to Dmitry Slobodin, our uh, financial chief financial officer. Chief financial officer. Tell him, Dima, if this shareholder won't help us, we are done. I remember sitting at home, uh, nothing I can do, like nothing. So I went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> and in the morning I found that the shareholder transfer money to the factory and pay this freaking bank. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But it was only beginning. Because 2009 was absolutely terrible. As I said, we went down to uh, less than 150 people at the factory. We got uh, laid off some people at Inwa. We were cutting our costs. And we did everything. Uh, it still weren't enough. We needed some fresh money and we couldn't find it. To the point that I, it was probably September or October, and we didn't have money to pay payroll to you guys. So I went and uh, took all money our family had on the savings. I left $300 and we paid uh, payrolls. Is this when Dimitri came to us and said, can you guys wait a couple days to get paid? Yeah, I think we, we, we weren't even able to pay full amount, so we, we paid short, I think. Yeah. It was money from my saving account. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. So we had two kids. One was less than a year old. <laughs> Another one was less than three year old. We had three hundred dollars in cash and some space on credit cards. That's it. This this was the lowest point. <laughs> Every day, all you can think of where to get money. You're waking up with the thought. You go to bed with the thought. You don't sleep well. <laughs> And then magic happened, when we were ready to die. <laughs> Somehow, uh, the friend of friend of Dmitry uh, got interested in the company and uh, expressed his willingness to help. Uh, he was a businessman from uh, Russian Far East. Okay who somehow, uh, I don't know, I don't really know what uh, motivated him. He felt the challenge and he was, uh, I think, and he uh, somehow felt the respect for what we have been doing. Huh. So we met. And the guy was from, it was interesting geography. So this person, his name was Igor Rubensov. Yeah. He was from Russian Far East. His friend was uh, Dima's Dima classmate living in Japan and living in the United States. So somehow we organized a meeting. So this eager he came to Seattle and we met in Silver Cloud in Redmond. The Silver Cloud in Redmond. Uh, yeah, I remember I was sick. I got a call to something. And I didn't want to go to this meeting because I thought this is bullshit. I was convinced this is bullshit, but somehow I kind of pushed myself out of bed and went to this meeting. I remember sitting there, I was cold, and the uh, uh, manager of the hotel, he brought me a few persimmons. <laughs> so I was eating with these persimmons and talking to the singer, and 
kind of uh, trying to convince him that <laughs> that you were worth the risk. We were worth the risk, here, yes. <laughs> On next day, we signed the agreement. It was just a piece of paper. We both signed, and we were saved. <laughs>